The Sasquatch of Jackson Farm by Christine and Christopher Kizelos. Chapter 1. Second Chance The Trinity River flows for many miles through the meadows, forests, and canyons of northwest California, just below the Oregon border. It pushes its way deep into the Six Rivers National Forest, and tucked away in the heart of this forest along that river is a small mountain town by the name of Willow Creek. If you take a stroll down its main street, you'll pass the mechanic, the butcher, the grocery store, the bank, and the sheriff's office. American flags flutter patriotically outside all of the stores and homes. It would seem at first glance that Willow Creek is no different from any town you may find anywhere across the great United States of America. But Willow Creek is no ordinary town. It's the Sasquatch capital of the world. The Sasquatch is a creature that has existed in the great myths of many cultures for thousands of years. In the Himalayas, he's known as a Yeti. Australians call him a Yowie. And in other parts of the world, he goes by skunk ape or oily man monster. Americans call him a Sasquatch or Bigfoot, and he's said to be a towering, hairy, human-like being that roams the dense, old-growth forests of our Earth. What places Willow Creek on the map is the multitude of strange sightings and tales of the Sasquatch that have occurred over the town's recorded history. Many a Willow Creeker will tell you about the bizarre sights they've seen, or the blood-tingling sounds they've heard. Is there truth to the tales? Or is this some brilliant marketing ploy carried through the ages? Many in the town believe. Some don't care. Most are just grateful for the trickle of tourists eager to go on a Sasquatch hunt or collect one of the many souvenirs for sale. Whatever tickles your fancy. A Sasquatch adorned poster, t-shirt, bottle of wine, mugs, stickers, even a throw rug, perhaps. It's hard to make a living in these parts. There are droughts that can choke a farmer's existence, pine bark beetles that can strip a forest bear, leaving it even more susceptible to wildfires, and the big cities that call away the young people for a faster and, debatably, better life. There are many Willow Creekers who have no time for tall stories or fairy tales, especially one certain inhabitant, Bill Jackson. If you travel farther west, through the town right to the outskirts, you'll come to an almost hidden driveway with an old wood sign, barely hanging on, that notifies you that you've arrived at Jackson Farm. This has been the home of the Jackson family for more than three generations. William Jackson, also known as Bill or Pa, was the son of William, who was the son of William. And there were probably a few Williams before that. Down the long dirt driveway is the small farm, complete with a cozy timber farmhouse and rusty red barn. Both could have used a paint job 10 years ago. The farm is insulated from the world by trees all around, and backs right onto the expansive National Forest. There's a scattering of orchard trees, a small paddock of pumpkins that is always ready for Halloween, and then another small paddock for whatever produce he cares for that particular season. It's an honest living, but a hard living. He can manage the farm by himself with a bit of help from seasonal workers, and he likes it that way. His wife, Eleanor, passed a few years back, and he was estranged from his only child, so he had bitterly resolved himself to the lonely life of a widow. Bill is a Willow Creeker born and bred. He met his beloved at the local high school. They married young, and they raised their daughter on the farm. He served for his country as a member of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines. Other than a couple of tours of Vietnam, this is where he spent his life. He had no desire to travel. He'd seen the world in all its nightmares and horrors. He wanted nothing but the kind of peace that only the wind that blows through the fir trees on a clear winter day can provide. Bill was a no-fuss, black-and-white, down-the-line kind of man. But sometimes in life, the lines become fuzzy. 
colors seep in and then sometimes, sometimes you're left with no choice. You can't ignore the magic that surrounds you. The sun was low in the sky on this particular fall afternoon. Bill and his neighbor Ed had decided to get an afternoon of hunting in before their farms ate up the rest of their days in the harvest months ahead. Bill was gruff in look and in nature, a tall, stocky man with a wiry platinum white beard and crown. He had no care to shave, as there was nobody to shave for anymore. He moved stealthily through the forest, just a few steps behind Ed. Ed was a foot shorter than Bill, but strong and lean. He, on the other hand, had a clean, close shave, as close to the bone as possible, as it had been every day since his daddy had given him his first razor. He was as gruff and as rough as Bill, maybe even more so. He, too, had lived the life of a soldier, but his wife had left him decades ago, and he had never found another love that could have softened the edges. The air was cool. It passed right through their bones and frosted their breaths as they pressed on through the thick, ancient trees. There was silence all around, and they carefully placed their weight on the heavy foliage underfoot, hoping not to startle any deer that may be nearby. Bill looked down and frowned, slightly puzzled. Small crimson-red flowers dotted the path. They were like summer kisses, delicate and oddly placed for this time of year. They walked on, and the flowers grew in density, blooming gloriously around their feet on the forest floor, stranger still. The trees on their path parted, and before them was a clearing nestled in a tight circle of trees, a small meadow burgeoning with flora of every shade of sunlight with splashes of royal purple. What is this? Bill's eyes soaked in the wonder. Bill. Ed waved him over. Bill found Ed standing in front of three chickens gently clucking from within an enclosure made of thick bracken vines. My chickens. Ed braced his gun with the trigger finger ready, narrowed his eyes as he looked suspiciously over their surroundings. Bill cocked his head. He was just as confused. In the thick ahead, the snap of branches underfoot caught their attention and both, with their hearts pounding, raised their guns toward the sound. Insects began to buzz, birds chirped across the sky. The high alertness pumped adrenaline through their bodies. Their senses heightened and their minds were drawn only to that moment. The branches and brush on the other side of the clearing parted. The men's trigger fingers tensed. Through the brush stepped what they both recognized from the tales of the town, a Sasquatch. A goddamn Sasquatch. They inhaled sharply, not taking their eyes off it. They took in its coarse fur with a red-brown sheen that wisped and curled all over. The beast was huge, about four heads taller than both of them, lean but with bulging muscles. It emanated strength, the pure, undeniable brute force of nature. They both felt small, tiny even, as it emerged from behind the trees. It stopped in its tracks and looked directly at them, its big brown, doe-like eyes frozen in terror as its smooth brown skin creased worriedly. Mountain lions snarled at each other over the forest. Bill couldn't swallow, but holy mother of Mary, he had never seen anything so amazing. He slowly lowered his gun. He sensed it meant no harm, but Ed held fast. The sounds of insects, birds, and other woodland creatures swelled into a deafening roar, as if the whole forest could feel the tension. The Sasquatch gave a low, uneasy growl. Ed pulled the trigger, a single shot, straight through the heart. The beast crumbled on the spot with only a soft whimper and lay motionless on the ground. The woods were silent once more. Jesus, Ed. All this time, I thought it was coyotes taking my chickens. They both walked over and looked down at the body. The cold, hard, skeptic part of their minds took over, even though they were staring at the cold, hard facts. So what is it? Some kind of mangy bear? 
I ain't seen no bear that can build a chicken coop. Both men stood staring at the body in silence. Maybe it's a government experiment. Designed to steal chickens? Bill shrugged. Ted Jeffrey says he's seen Sasquatches in these woods. I'm surprised he can see anything after all that moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've heard the stories. You know where we live. Bill was about to reply, but a small cry coming from the body of the creature halted their conversation. Ed raised his gun to finish the job. Wait. Bill carefully bent down over the creature and with great difficulty rolled up its back. Nestled underneath was a crying baby Sasquatch, still clinging to its dead mama. Bill stopped breathing again. The little creature looked up at him with dewy brown eyes, large and round and full of humanity. His heart melted ever so slightly. Ed pointed his gun directly at the baby. Stand back. Bill calmly raised his arm and placed his hand on Ed's barrel, slowly lowering it. Don't. Ed kept his finger on the trigger. It's as good as dead out here on its own. Bill frowned and his heart just ached for this creature in a way he'd not known his heart to feel for some time. It's not right. It's just a child. Ed raised his gun, but Bill shook his head. I'll look after it. Ed lowered his gun again, clearly frustrated. I, I know you've been in a bad way since Eleanor, but this thing, it ain't gonna fill her place. Bill's neck muscles tensed as his crystal blue eyes flicked with a momentary rage of pain. He couldn't just kill this baby or abandon it. There was something inside of him that would not let him be that cold. The creature was visibly shaking as it began to howl softly. Bill dropped his gun and cautiously picked up the baby, who was at least as big as a toddler. It had the same red-brown fur as his mother, with the matching wisps of curls all over. Looks like it's a boy. The little orphan continued to cry. Ed watched both of them with a growing look of disgust. You got enough trouble with your farm and the drought. The economy's bust. Don't be wasting your time with some godless Sasquatch. It'll turn on you someday. The baby wrapped its arms around Bill's neck. It had a deep smell, like an armpit of the earth, but Bill felt oddly fine with it. Ed frowned deeper. We could make some serious cash from this, turn our farms around. Bill shook his head firmly. And have tourists in our face every day? Journalists? Scientists? The damn government could seize our farms. Are you kidding me? Don't breathe a word of it to anybody. Ed nodded reluctantly. He and Bill didn't agree on a lot in life, but they could agree that they wanted nothing to do with anyone from the outside world. Ed sighed and looked up at the sky. It was going to be dark soon and he wanted to get home. He swung his rifle onto his back and pulled the vines apart on the makeshift chicken coop. He scooped a chicken under each arm and the third he carried in his hands. The chickens clucked and wriggled a little, but mostly obliged. He started to walk away, but stopped and turned to face Bill. If that thing comes anywhere near my chickens, it's finished. Bill nodded wearily. He won't. I'll keep him on the farm till he's big enough to fend for himself. Once he's back in the wild, he's on his own. Bill started to stuff the furry orphan into his coat trying to replicate the warmth that had drained from his dead mother on the forest floor. I gotta get him home and fed, or he won't make it through the night. I bet you do, Mommy. <laughs> Ed turned and disappeared out of the clearing. He popped his head back through the branches. I'll keep your secret, Bill, on one condition. You name your new pet, Dog. Bill just nodded absentmindedly as he looked down at the dead mother. What about her body? Just leave it for the coyotes. The sound of his footsteps slowly disappeared into the forest. Bill looked down at the fuzzy little Sasquatch now snuggled into his chest. The creature raised his face, still whimpering, and Bill looked into those big brown eyes. He wondered what he was getting himself into. The scratching of branches caught his attention and he turned his head back toward the dead mother. 
He took an uneasy step back as long, thick, woody vines sprouted from the earth and wrapped themselves around the lifeless mother's body. He had a mind to call after Ed, but what was the use? He stood watching, not knowing what this phenomenon was, but he was transfixed. The vines grew thicker, covering the Sasquatch, then began to pull her body down into the dirt under the forest floor. In a blink, she was gone, buried. All that remained was a soft mound of earth. Hairs stood on the back of Bill's neck. Yellow, red, and orange flowers like morning sun breaking the night burst into bloom where the mother once laid. Bill had never before doubted his eyes. Now he questioned every sensible fiber of his being. He had seen beauty before, but he'd now crossed into a threshold of wonderment he'd never knew existed. He had stumbled into another world that lay hidden within our own, that only a handful are honored to ever see and experience, and now he was beholden to it. A coyote howled in the distance. Bill bundled the Sasquatch infant deeper in his coat, slung his gun over his shoulder and took one last look at the clearing. The flowers fluttered gently in the evening breeze and carried the sweetest scent through the forest. Later in life, Bill would often talk of that chilly fall afternoon. He knew that he had lived a life that was full of mistakes, full of misdeeds, and full of regrets. But he had no idea that by giving that creature a second chance, that creature would one day give him his. The baby's whimper grew louder, so Bill hastily began to trek his way back to the farm, his mind racing, not understanding what he had just seen or how he was going to raise an orphan Sasquatch. But the words of his late father, William Sr., rang clear. One step at a time, boy. One step at a time.